Uh, the other day, I was in the kitchen and I found some mouse droppings in my kitchen. And uh, concerned about the hygiene of my kitchen, I set a little trap. Uh, peanut butter, I decided would be the temptation that this mouse just could not refuse. Hi, it's Barry here from Turning the Page, just another uh, YouTube or podcast that you're that I'm sending out to you. So yeah, I set this trap and off I went to bed. And in the middle of the night, I heard uh, the mouse trap go off, snap. And and I heard it rattling around. I thought, good. I thought, right. When I wake up in the morning, I will dispose of that little rodent. And I went back to sleep. Only to be woken a few hours later, later with a banging and a clattering going on under my bed. I was like banging and clattering. And what on earth is that? I'm kind of annoyed. I got up and I looked under the bed. And here was the little mouse. And its foot was caught in the trap. <clears throat> and so, you know, it's a bit of a dilemma. Um, what do I do? Uh, do I kill the mouse? And if so, how? Uh, do I let it go and let it live for another day? Uh, will it come back if I let it go? And then, then I, I realized that it um, had actually dragged itself in the trap like 12 meters from the kitchen to my bedroom at, you know, while I was asleep. And that amazed me that it had, it had came it had actually come to the only other um, mammal, I suppose, like itself, uh, seeking help, whereas the, the mammal was actually the one trying to kill it. Um, but it needed help from someone bigger, and it chose me. Uh, compassion and pity, you know, prodded at my heart. And so I opened the door, the outside door, and I let it go. And it will probably be okay, I hope, maybe, maybe I don't know. Uh, but perhaps it will have a lump. <laughs> but it was lured by something overwhelmingly good, peanut butter. And it got caught, but not enough to kill it. It needed something um, beyond its own ability to help. It needed compassion and mercy. Now, I want you to think of a time when you have been that vulnerable to the choices of others. You've been caught. Uh, the addiction or something has trapped you again. And the judgment gavel has been raised. And you're looking at your failure and condemning yourself as a failure. And uh, the death shroud of shame is suffocating you. And what you most need uh, is what you least expect to happen. And that is uh, compassion and mercy. Justice, mercy, grace. You see, justice is getting what we deserve. There is justice, there is right, there is wrong, there is also struggle, fragility, human weakness, forces beyond our understanding and control. There is a plain getting it wrong when we thought we were getting it right. There is a hidden self to us that no one sees, even ourselves. And then there is mercy, not getting what we deserve. We have dodged that bullet. Phew. We haven't been killed by the mousetrap, <laughs> but we have it wrapped around our feet. We are thankful, but we wonder what will come next. And then there's grace, getting what we don't deserve. We are given the opportunity to live again. Uh, we might have a limp, but we sense a new release. And um, if you look at justice, mercy, and grace, I think compassion is like the oil that lubricates the movement between positions of justice to mercy, between positions of mercy to grace. And you can't move from justice to mercy to grace without compassion lubricating the wheels. 
you know, I listen to people and their stories, and in every story, there are a series of broken world choices made. Some choices are dosed with wisdom, and others are dosed with poison. And uh, it's a um, it's a soup we are walking through, a messy soup, where no one gets it right. I repeat, no one gets it right. And if I was speaking to an audience, I'd say, can you say that with me? No one gets it right. <laughs> So if you're there watching or listening, please say, no one gets it right. Um, enough stress and all sorts of weird stuff happens in our brain that then leaks over into our relationships and it makes more sloppy soup. And these are the stories of people like you and I. I need compassion. You need compassion. Nobody gets it right. I repeat, no one gets it right. And as I went back to bed after showing compassion to that little mouse, the thought struck me. God is compassion. Want to know God? Want to know compassion? Look at God. We look at this heart movement in Jesus. And Matthew 9.36 says, when he looked over the crowds, his heart broke. So confused and aimless they were, like sheep with no shepherd. Matthew 9.36 And to every confused and aimless sheep or mouse that broken world experiences has ensnared, God is compassion. To those who have lost someone to suicide, know that God is compassion. For the multiple times every day that when you lose focus on God, know that God is compassion. It's not an optional extra. Compassion is the fullness of God's personality. Psalm 145 says that the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made, including little mice. <laughs> Please show compassion to yourself and others. Be gentle on yourself. Know God's compassion for you in this broken world mess. Here's some quotes. When we become quiet enough to let go of people, we learn compassion for them. We can be with people in their hurt and need. We can speak a word out of our inner silence that will set them free. Richard Foster In cultivating compassion, we draw from the wholeness of our experience, our suffering, our empathy, as well as our cruelty and terror. It has to be this way. Compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounder. It is a relationship between equals. Only when we know our own darkness well can we be present with the darkness of others. Compassion becomes real when we recognise our shared humanity. Brene Brown Compassion and patience are absolutely unique characteristics of true spiritual authority. Richard Raw. A spiritual leader who lacks basic human compassion has almost no power to change other people because people intuitively know he or she does not present the big or the divine or big truth. Such leaders have to rely upon role, laws, and enforcement powers to effect any change in others. Such change does not go deep, nor does it last. Richard Raw. You learn to become or more compassionate the same way you learn anything else, through repeated practice. Rick Hansen. Compassion for yourself is where you start, when things are tough, not where you stop. Rick Hansen. When grace enters a room, we should begin to dance, but sadly, more often than not, we let some little thing, some minor mosquito bite, blind us to grace's presence. Ronald Rollheiser. Compassion means entering the suffering of another in order to lead the way out. Rosaria Champ Champagne Butterfield. Justice is getting what we deserved. Mercy is not getting what we, what is deserved. Grace is getting what is not deserved. Daryl Johnson. Questions. One, 
Where have you experienced the gift of compassion? Number two, what moves your heart to places of compassion? Number three, what's it like to be gentle on yourself and others? Here's a formation exercise. There's a movement between positions of justice, mercy and grace. Compassion lubricates that movement. Think of someone who you feel needs a good dose of justice. <laughs> Getting what they deserve. And prayerfully ask for compassion to fill your heart and move you to a place of mercy, not getting what they deserve. And then grace, getting what they don't deserve. Oh, that's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> hey, I hope you found this helpful. Uh, please consider sharing this with other people. Uh, hit the share button. Uh, like it. Um, Leave a comment wherever you um, listen to this and so promoting what we're doing here at Turning the Page. Uh, send me an email. Love to hear from my peoples. And um, there's lots of links in the show notes below. But until next time, God is compassionate.